morning, everyone. Uh, in this session on the economies, the major economies of Asia, uh, my comments are focused um, essentially on India. And the panel, of course, will go into a broader framework. We're a late starter in Asia. Um, our uh, years of rapid growth began after most of East Asia had slowed down, barring, of course, China uh, with the uh, Asian crisis. Uh, and our story really, therefore, is, uh, belongs to the 21st century. Um, and it's now about 15 years since we've been averaging 7.5% uh, annual growth. Uh, there is no reason to believe that that cannot be sustained for the next 10 or 15 years uh, before we hit any uh, productivity uh, hurdles or bottlenecks. Uh, so we've trebled the economy in the last 15 years, and if you treble again in the next 15, we basically uh, multiplied the economy tenfold uh, since 2000. Uh, and uh, in 15 years' time, we will therefore be an $8 trillion economy, uh, making us clearly the third largest in the world, following the U.S. and China. So that's the macro numbers. Um, but I think it's important to uh, emphasize that uh, our story is still um, only partially done. Um, number one, as uh, Martin Wolf wrote some years ago, this is a case of being a premature superpower. We're not, of course, a superpower, but that's the phrase you used, uh, in the sense that uh, the economy has a certain, and the country and the economy have a certain rising presence uh, in the region and beyond. But uh, we are still largely a poor or lower, lower uh, middle income economy. Our per capita income is only $2,000 today. Um, and in that sense, there is a great deal of work that remains to be done domestically in terms of development challenges. Our physical infrastructure is far from complete. Our uh, social uh, realities in terms of life expectancy uh, and uh, other indicators are all below global averages. So there is still a lot of catching up to do, and the country's primary focus will therefore remain on these domestic challenges and making sure that we deal with them. So, um, but if we look at just the economic reforms uh, story so far, and particularly for the Modi government, which completes its five years in six months' time, um, the Modi government has done three significant or signature reforms other than a whole lot of other stuff. Um, the first, of course, is the introduction uh, of the goods and services tax, which has transformed our indirect tax system. Uh, the second is a bankruptcy code, which has radically changed the relationship between banks and lenders and borrowers, uh, and shifted the power to the banks because we have a huge uh, bad debt problem, which uh, we've been wrestling with for some time. And uh, the third is putting monetary policy on a clear track of uh, almost single-minded focus on controlling inflation. So, um, so monetary policy, fiscal policy, and the financial sector, these have been key um, introductions into the system uh, in the last two, three years. Um, but there are a lot of things, or three or four other things that you can say have not been done. Um, mostly, it can be summarized by saying that we have reformed most product markets, but we have not reformed our factor markets, factors as in factors of production. So uh, the labor market is still highly regulated. Uh, the laws are still essentially restrictive, although there has been some tinkering at the edges, some at the center, others in the states. Um, our land market is still far from free, and uh, new laws have actually, in some ways, made it even more rigid. Uh, and, of course, our financial market has been in turmoil because of the bad debt problem that the banks are wrestling with. And now the shadow banks have also been caught up in it. So uh, 
uh, all these three key areas where the factor markets have to be made more efficient um, and smoother, uh, that's a job that still really waits to be done. And so that's, that's work to be done. Uh, in terms of where the action has been, uh, a lot of it has been in physical infrastructure. Uh, we have um, trebled the pace of highway construction to about 30 kilometers a day, uh, going up to 40, hopefully, in the near future. And a lot of money has gone into modernizing the railways. Um, there has been a change on the digital uh, side. Uh, we built major digital platforms, and some more are being built. Uh, which will uh, make, uh, which will be the base for launching a whole set of new businesses, and there is a startup story going on in India. Uh, they will also create platforms for greater financial transparency and therefore for ease of credit. Um, so these are potentially transformative um, as they roll out, and uh, some of them can be replicated in other countries. Um, so those are the key changes uh, that one could quickly uh, summarize. Um, I've been in Australia for three, four days, and there is a sense that uh, people are getting a little browned off with China, which was not the reflective mood today, but and that there is more attention being paid to India. And uh, this is a story in other parts of Asia as well. Um, and I would like to present the view that um, I don't think India is about to become a second China. Uh, I think what we will be is, is second to China. Um, even if we are $8 trillion uh, 15 years from now, that's smaller than China today at $12 billion, or trillion, sorry. Um, so that should give us some sense of, uh, of the reality of the different stages of development uh, for the two uh, countries. Uh, we're also quite different as countries, uh, in, different in our histories, uh, different in our culture is different in our political system. Um, we are different in the model of growth that we've adopted. Um, India is not a manufacturing success in the way that China and some other countries uh, have been in East Asia. Um, our, our success story is more in services um, and potentially, to some degree, in agriculture. And I'll come back to that uh, a little later. The, uh, the uh, impact of that, therefore, on, of India's rise and of its, uh, its rapid growth uh, projected into the future is that the impact of that will be different um, in East Asia and, and Australia than um, the impact of China. Because we will not have the manufacturing linkages and the supply chains that the Chinese uh, economy has created. Uh, our integration with, um, with East Asia and uh, Australia is much less uh, than it could have been, and I'm not sure that it will be transformative even in the foreseeable future. Um, so, uh, and nor do we project power in the way that China does. Uh, we are active diplomatically, but um, China is a country that seeks to change the rules um, and reset the rules in its favor. Um, India is uh, essentially a status quo power uh, and uh, wants to play by the rules as they exist. Um, so uh, it would, you know, be comfortable in a multipolar situation with friends um, rather than looking for a numero uno position. So these are very different approaches uh, to, to the region and the world, and these are very different realities, therefore, within the countries. Uh, India, therefore, will remain a sort of swing power in a, in a potentially binary world of China and the U.S. as we're seeing emerge. Um, our um, real uh, impact of our growth will be essentially um, seen domestically because our growth is essentially domestic and not export-driven in the way that other economies have managed. So, uh, and that will be seen in the rise of our, the strength of our consumer classes, which is already a bit of a story, um, but even more so when in the next 10 or 15 years, as the 
the consumer classes today, if they're about 300 million in a population of 1.3 billion, could easily double. Um, and each of those members would have far much more money to spend. Uh, if you look at the international business projections by business sectors, um, internationally, the aviation sector sees India as the third largest uh, aviation market well before 2030. Uh, the car business, the automobile companies, expect India to be the third largest car market before overtaking Japan and Germany, again, well before 2030. Um, there are other uh, businesses which will rise to prominence. Um, with, with the launch of some of our digital platforms, mobile data traffic, I think, is already number one uh, for India. So uh, it is that domestic consumption story that will be the real uh, change that we see as the economy uh, uh, moves ahead. The, um, the, the sense I get when I look at uh, companies, uh, talk to people in here in Australia, is that uh, certainly your mining industry is reluctant uh, to invest in India because it sees uh, India as a difficult uh, place to do business. And mining, of course, is a complicated business more than others. Um, and uh, it is also true that uh, the uh, India's performance on the World Bank's annual rankings of ease of doing business have been quite poor, but there is a change. Uh, we used to be ranked about 140 uh, four or five years ago. Uh, last year, we moved up to 100. Uh, yesterday, the current latest year's numbers were released, and we are up at 77. In both years, India recorded the fastest move up the, up the ranks. And uh, Mr. Modi had promised that he would get it uh, up to 50 before he left office. So that's still possible. So from 140 to 50 in three or four years would, would reflect some of the changes that are happening in the local business environment. But uh, I would say that, uh, to me, the truest words on, um, on investing in India uh, were said by a global CEO who said that you have to look at India in three ways. Um, and in his experience, and he is a sort of multi-product conglomerate, uh, the, the easiest way to achieve success in India is when you depend on the abilities of the Indian people. Um, the second is when you depend on the Indian market. And the third is when you depend on the Indian government and on government policy. And you're most likely to succeed if you depend on the Indian people, which is a story of the technology companies uh, and how they've moved. Uh, and if you depend on the Indian market, it was slow initially. It's picked up now. It will pick up further. But there is success that you can see uh, for companies that uh, tapped the Indian market or the consumer market. And the third is if you depend on, on government and government policy, then it can get tricky. Uh, and uh, I think the mining industry here, when looks at India, is really looking at government policy. And so I can understand the diffidence about uh, investing. But there are lots of other businesses, including in the services sectors, where you can actually come in and um, find ways of um, making money. Uh, the example I gave is of uh, Germany, which initially was a little after our 1991 reforms began. Um, Germany was focused post-unification on its in immediate hinterland uh, and the, you know, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. So its neighboring countries, Czechoslovakia and so on, became attractive hinterland to develop into. And then they went into China. So they were actually latecomers into India. But today you have 1,700 German companies in the country uh, doing great business. And German, company, German products are not the cheapest. And India is actually a low, low price market for almost anything. Um, but German companies have done very well, and they're growing faster than uh, the GDP is growing. Uh, I think their average growth, they, the German Chamber of Commerce acknowledges is about 11% a year, year after year. So uh, there are lots of success stories like that which suggest that if you take the trouble to come into India, it does actually work uh, quite well. Um, the uh, other story is, of course, about people the Indian people, and I come back to the point that uh, it's not just people in India, it's people from India moving outside India, which has been a diaspora story across the globe. 
um, and you're now seeing some of it over here. Uh, uh, added to that is the whole issue of Indian students uh, moving and studying to going to universities overseas. Um, again, Australia has been seeing greater numbers and moving up the ranks. Um, and I see that as a potential foundation for much greater ties uh, between the two countries. So uh, it remains people, markets, and only then uh, government policy and investment because the reform story is only partially done and we are still a work in progress. Uh, I mentioned agriculture, and I do want to say that I wrote a piece uh, recently, um, and I, we met the Farmers Federation here. The um, Australian uh, farmers look at India essentially as a market for its products, for their products. So they see India as a consumer. And the truth is that we have now uh, become as much of a, a cultural exporter as Australia. Our numbers are exactly the same, $45 billion. Uh, and yet India is not a member of the Keynes group of agricultural exporting countries. Uh, maybe we should think of doing that, but that's, that's for us to think about. But uh, the significant point about it is that Australia exports two-thirds or more of its agricultural production. We, uh, $45 billion for us is just this export surplus after feeding 1.3 billion people. So, and our productivity levels are half of global standards. Uh, so it is easy to see that if productivity were to increase, the surpluses would grow quite dramatically. Uh, we have in recent years been the largest exporter of rice, um, a new export rice. Um, and if our, if our export surpluses actually do grow, and agricultural growth is now at three times population growth, so it is almost inevitable that we'll have more, much more agricultural surpluses going into the future than we ever had in the past. So the impact of that on global agricultural markets, the viability of farming businesses in many countries uh, will be an issue. Um, India, equally, India will have to relook at its own agricultural policies and its protective stance on all of that. Um, so there is an issue on agriculture which usually does not get much attention. What does get attention is a trade issue. And it is because, in my view, we are not uh, strong in terms of manufacturing that we essentially adopt a negative uh, or a defensive position in almost all trade talks. Uh, there was a phase when we signed up a series of bilateral uh, free trade agreements, um, Korea, Singapore, Thailand, um, ASEAN itself. And then they did a review two or three years ago of how these agreements had worked. And the view that emerged was that it had not worked the advantage of Indian business. Now, that is not the problem with the agreements. The problem is with not having used the agreements to drive domestic productivity to a level where you would compete. S but at the moment, uh, we are still seen uh, as being defensive, as having high tariffs, as having non-tariff barriers. And uh, that's e even more clear in the negotiations over RCEP, which is this regional comprehensive economic partnership between uh, a dozen countries. And uh, more than a dozen, I think. So. Um, India has been, has been an outlier in the negotiations over RCEP. But the essential um, position that I would see is that India does not want and probably will not allow a situation where India is left out of RCEP, and that RCEP launches without India. Um, and I'm not sure that's good for RCEP either, because it will become so China dominant. So we need to uh, make the adjustments fairly quickly because time is running out, uh, and sign up on RCEP. And that should address, uh, if it's a high quality thing where you make the commitments on up to 95% of tariff lines, that should address the whole trade issue or a substantial part of the trade issue where you have a sense from here that uh, India is not uh, coming up uh, to the table. So, um, in a sense, uh, my um, projection of where India will go is that we are on a steady track, and we will stay on that steady track. 
Uh, we have not had too many bumps on the way. There have been ups and downs. There was a global financial crisis, and we are susceptible to very sharp uh, spurts in oil prices. So you had those ups and downs. But essentially, you're able to sustain a fairly comfortable 7.5% over a long period of time. And so our profile and uh, our um, role in the region can only increase. It will not challenge China, but it will be second to China in what it does. And to my mind, uh, almost all of that greater inter integration with Asia will be to the positive. So uh, with those, I'd like to stop in my initial comments and take part in the discussion that follows. Thank you very much.